Hello, I'm Rob Westervelt, editor of IHS Chemical Week, and welcome to the 2014 IHS Chemical World Petrochemical Conference. And I'm delighted to be here with Dave Witte, Senior VP at IHS and General Manager of IHS Chemical. Thanks, Rob. I'm Dave, glad to be here as joining. well. Great. Uh, your presentation today, you outlined, um, obviously a big theme of the conference is how unconventional energy and shale is transforming the energy, uh, transforming chemical markets. Uh, and you outlined some of those dynamics and um, went into the complexity that, that, that that's causing. Uh, give us some examples of how the industry is becoming more complex and how do you see that playing out over the next few years as this build continues? Well, I, I think, you know, there's always been complexity in the chemical industry because it's so interrelated in many different facets uh, from the standpoint of relationships into the, uh, the end markets on, on demand um, and relationships up into the energy framework as well. And so I think the complexities are coming as a function of, of, of several different areas. First of all, uh, globalization. Um, the industry is, is clearly becoming more globalized under the WTO regime. Trade patterns and free trade agreements uh, um, you know, are, are becoming a, uh, an integral part of how the markets connect with, uh, with one another. But secondly, I think the, the, the real complexity comes in this breakthrough from a technological standpoint, and there's really been two uh, breakthroughs. The, the first one is... Uh, uh, the technology that's associated with shale, combination of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling that's unleashed this um, new set of feedstocks, natural gas liquids here first in the United States. And um, the, the, one of the issues is that it's happened so quickly uh, that the market and the infrastructure has not really been able to, to keep up with the changes. And so there's been dramatic shifts in the relationships, the dis historical relationships of those feedstocks that have come out with crude oil. And it's created uh, uh, strange opportunities and, and indirect effects. So just uh, one that I mentioned today was, for example, shale uh, and the impact on, on coal prices globally that relates back to the cost of making methanol and ammonia in China since they're based on coal and that is as shale has come on and, and, and added feedstock uh, to allow power uh, producers here in the United States to, uh, to change their mix and make more uh, gas which incidentally has reduced our carbon dioxide emissions. It's also generally pushed more coal out into the global markets. That's uh, decreased the uh, price of coal and impacted the, the cost, the marginal cost of production of methanol and ammonia. And we see examples of these kinds of indirect and secondary relationships happening uh, all over. Uh, another one, uh, for example, is the fact that this uh, very light crude that's being produced in the United States uh, is very paraffinic in nature. Uh, the, the refineries are having to run that here, and it has an impact on the requirement for octane to be blended into the gasoline pool. And because it's more paraffinic, you know, the cost of doing that uh, gets higher. That impacts the marginal cost of aromatics and octate in the United States. And so there's all these, these complicated secondary effects that begin to you know, uh, come out of just that simple relationship of uh, you know, more shale, uh, shale technology that's unleashed these feedstocks. And obviously a lot of interest, and I'm sure you're getting a lot of questions about the pace of the supply build. In, the, in North America. Um, and what are your thoughts on um, you know, the balance between reshoring, which will be a bit slower to start, and the need for exports? How is that going to play out? Yeah, so absolutely. I think it's a, uh, it's a very uh, um, uh, pressing question. You know, we've got a lot of, of new builds that are coming in the United States to take advantage of the, the, the shale-based feedstocks. Um, a large number of, uh, of steam crackers based on ethane, a large number of propane dehydrogenation units based on propane. And in the timing of these is, is somewhat in question and how they stretch out because of the availability of, of labor resources here to be able to build all of these facilities. Uh, but at the end of the day, we think that there's going to be a number of them built. There's going to be a number of them built over the next eight to ten years. And um, so a lot of supply that's coming on the market relatively quickly. On the other hand, the domestic demand growth uh, you know, has been relatively slow for the United States over the last decade as we've seen downstream industries um, 
hollow out from a manufacturing standpoint and move to low cost centers. Um, now that we have this availability of, of feedstocks and lower power costs, lower electricity costs in the United States, our expectation is that some of those manufacturing uh, industries downstream will rebuild, but we expect that they're going to rebuild at a much slower pace than the supply that's coming on uh, with the shale, uh, uh, shale supply from a basic chemical standpoint. And so in order to balance the U.S. market um, until that domestic demand grows bigger, we're going to see significant exports of uh, commodity petrochemicals out of the United States into markets like Latin America, into Asia Pacific, uh, China, the large importing markets that can consume this additional supply that's coming on. And in terms of the potential for reshoring, which segments uh, does it make more sense at this point? Or, or are there any going to be early, early movers there? Yeah, so from our perspective, you know, there's, there's a number of drivers behind the, the reshoring or the repatriation of uh, downstream manufacturing industries. There was kind of a knee-jerk reaction when China came into WTO to, you know, push uh, offshoring very hard. You know, purchasing managers had targets. You must have X percent of your material being sourced offshore. And I think a decade of experience and changes in the market, including um, additional uh, uh, energy uh, changes, the energy framework that's happened here in the United States, um, uh, a decade of escalation of labor costs in China, um, the, the fact that you know, the experience of the supply chain is that these long, tortuous paths to you know, manufacture our material overseas and bring it to the United States has a number of risks with it in terms of supply chain risk, disruptions because of natural disasters or currency risks because of fluctuations in currency while that material is in transit so long. And so you have to look at each individual industry to determine which ones are most likely to come back. But by our analysis at IHS, it's really about um, you know, those types of industries that are complex, that have uh, relatively high shipping costs as a function of their end price, um, those manufacturing industries that have relatively low uh, labor input, that change dynamically such that you need to be able to balance the, the demand locally with a short supply chain to be able to react to that. And so, you know, that pushes us towards pushing, looking at automotive and automotive assemblies, um, looks at electronics and appliances and those types of, of businesses that have those characteristics. Great. And final question here. Um, where are we in the global profit cycle for basic chemicals and plastics today, and uh, how is that playing out by region? What are the different dynamics between the Americas, uh, Europe, and Asia? Yeah, I, I would say that the, the profit cycle is, uh, Rob, is, is very uh, bipolar. There's, yeah. a, there's a big spread in terms of, of earnings um, today. Um, for, for, for the business as a whole, we're looking at us continuing to go up into an up cycle. We have demand, our demand expectations because of a, an improving economy globally um, is going to be outpacing supply and the overall utilization rates, not for every uh, product, but for many, uh, and certainly in aggregate, will lead to higher profits uh, as we go forward for the globe. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the difference of those profit levels uh, between the regions is, is quite substantial. So those regions that are based like the United States or the Middle East on advantaged feedstocks are going to see very high, very strong margins simply as a function of the fact that there's advantaged uh, uh, feedstocks, hydrocarbon, compared to the end prices that are based on higher cost crude. In places like West Europe or Asia Pacific where they don't have that hydrocarbon advantage,